a lot of the research I did on this book, of course, I did upstairs, so I feel like I should say that. Um, and also, rather than read a chapter of the book, I, I've been doing a lot of readings, but I thought instead of reading from the book, I would uh, instead show some slides and talk about some of the books and the highlights of what I discovered in the making of the book. Um, I'll say what drew me to the, to the project in the first place is just the sheer number of books uh, about Butte that I've collected over the years and how many of them are novels. And it occurred to me that very few cities the size of Butte can boast that much literary output. It's actually almost uncanny um, that a dirty, grimy, ugly city of less than 50,000 people has attracted so many writers and filmmakers also, or that so many authors have come from Butte. It is really remarkable. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say in, as a general remark in my investigation was that Butte enjoys the status of being a character itself in a lot of these books, which I don't think really applies to many cities of its size. Uh, usually it's, you know, like Paris or New York has a certain character, but Butte definitely has that. Um, so I'll just get right into it. Um, and probably the, I'll start with the, with the best discovery first. Probably the most exciting thing I, I found was the, the very first Butte novel, I think it's actually one of the first Montana novels, it was written by this woman, uh, Josephine White Bates. She was born in Canada in 1857, came to New York at age nine, and attended college in Chicago. But somewhere along the way, she married Lyndon Bates, a blue, a blue blood from New York City and an engineer of some fame. He designed, for example, the Three Lake solution to the uh, Panama Canal project, and he also designed the Galveston Seawall after the hurricane in 1900. He was a, a, an engineer, but he um, spent some time in Butte. I don't know if he was a mining engineer. He's listed as a capitalist in the, uh, the Polk directory, um, but I also think he worked for the railroad. So I, I'm still doing research on these people. Um, in any case, Miss Josephine White Bates wrote and published in 1888, which is really early, uh, the first novel about Butte, Montana. And as, as I said, I think it's actually one of the first Butte or Montana novels called A Blind Lead, The Story of a Mine. And the novel is actually quite good. I discovered it entirely by accident. I opened it up in a thrift store somewhere, and my eyes fell on the phrase, the Silver Line Club. Uh, and I thought, wow, that sounds a lot like the Silver Bow Club. And sure enough, the book turned out to be set in Butte, but during the silver mining era. So it's one of the, in fact, the only book I read that focuses mainly on Butte when it was a silver mining town, as opposed to copper. Um, very few pictures of this woman for being as famous as she was in her day. She lived in a uh, pretty illustrious, busy life, rubbed elbows with the very wealthy in New York City and Chicago, but also with the literary figures of her day, including Arthur, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And she was close friends with the future president, Herbert Hoover, and his wife. And again, this is because Herbert Hoover was trained as an engineer. Um, a mining engineer, in fact, and worked with Lyndon Bates. A few years ago, I found out, because um, I also teach Latin, that the first person to translate De Re Metallica, the, the great late medieval uh, treatise on, on mining, to, the first person to translate it out of Latin was Herbert Hoover's wife. <laughs> See the trivia you get from reading Butte? Um, and this picture was taken about a year after her son died in the Lusitania, um, which was today. Um, and that actually tore apart their friendship with the Hoovers. Um, she was very involved in the Belgian uh, relief effort, and the sinking of the Lusitania, as you know, led to World War I, or at least the U.S. involvement in it. Um, and she was pretty bitter about that, even though she was an ardent hawk. Next up is Mary McLean. Um, although literature, most literature professors would hesitate to categorize Mary McLean as a novelist, I make the argument that the label fits her at least by default. It's hard to categorize what she wrote 
the collection of work that she wrote as anything else, really. And in many ways, her work displays an entirely new and innovative style, which is what, uh, which, you know, that's what a novel is supposed to do. The word novel means new. And mo more important than that, her first book, The Story of Mary, Mary McLean, put Butte on the literary map. She published it in 1902 when she was 19 years old. The story of Mary McLean shocked the world and made her a household name. I could probably talk all night about Mary McLean and the many anecdotes associated with her and her book, uh, but I'll just say a few things that I think encapsulate her importance to Butte and Montana literature. And I think they also provide some kind of hint about what a character she was. If you haven't read Mary McLean, I, I highly recommend it. She's something else. Um, so the first thing I would say is that she wanted to call this book, I Await the Devil's Coming. Uh, fortunately, her publisher talked her out of that. Um, this was 1902, after all. Um, and it's interesting that her publisher had some familiarity with young women and controversial novels because a few years earlier, he published The Awakening by Kate Chopin, or Chopin, um, which I think is one of the great American novels. And it also, like Mary McLean, was shocking. Unfortunately, it didn't sell nearly as well. I think uh, The Awakening sold maybe a thousand copies. But this uh, book, The Story of Mary McLean, sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Um, I'll just read the, the first little part of my, of my section on Mary McLean. So I opened the chapter on Mary McLean this way. Chances are good that a century from now, long after literary critics have stopped debating whether A.B. Guthrie or Norman McLean wrote the great Montana novel, Mary McLean will still draw readers to her clutch of odd books. The Story of Mary McLean, 1902, My Friend Annabelle Lee, 1903, and I, Mary McLean, A Diary of Human Days, 1917. Well, it strains the meaning of the term to call any of these works novels, but no other descriptor, memoir, prose poem, philosophical meditation, quite captures the brazen novelty of the work Mary McLean delivered to the world in the first decades of the 20th century. Her idiom resembles philosophy much more than it does biography or fiction, which has led some to draw comparisons to Nietzsche, and both authors present their ideas in ways that defy convention and easy categorization. Like Nietzsche, Mary McLean shocked her contemporaries by creating a style of writing that set more precedents than it followed. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that, but uh, the other thing I would say that sort of indicates what, a, what kind of a shocker, I guess she was, sort of the Lady Gaga of her day, is she, she made a feature-length film, 90-minute long film in 1917, and called it Men Who Have Made Love to Me. Unfortunately, uh, no known copies of this film exist, but there are some long, detailed reviews of it in newspapers of the time, so pe the people have been able to reproduce the plot, or at least know what the movie was about. Um, and there is a chance, according to a scholar I talked to recently, that uh, a copy of the film may have survived in Australia somewhere, and they're looking for it. But it would be uh, pretty exciting if somebody found that. Um, because she was so famous, her book inspired a lot of uh, parodies, and this is just one of them. This was written by, it, I think it was actually written by a man, but attributed to Mrs. McCown, 1903, published in Butte by the Intermountain uh, Press. Um, and this is The Devil's Reply to Mary McLean, because throughout the, throughout the story of Mary McLean, she addresses the devil and in the first person and so forth. Um, Trying to think of uh, what else I can say about her other than the obvious. She was way ahead of her time. Unfortunately, died a, a pretty lonesome death in Chicago early, but she sort of predicted it. Um, she was so famous in her day that they named the baseball team in Butte after her. There was a cigar named after her um, and a hot sauce. Another, another book, you'll, you'll note that another theme of my book is that many of these books were written by women. Um, and the Butte fiction tends to be very feminist, and surprisingly so, given the age in which a lot of this stuff was written. Um, this also was a bestseller, Gertrude Atherton's uh, Perch of the Devil. 
She published this book in 1914. She actually wrote it in Helena because Butte was too noisy to work in. Uh, historian Richard Rader called this the best of the lot of the books about Butte, but I doubt anyone who reads it would agree. While I appreciate Atherton's talent and I enjoy the prose of her essays on Butte, she also wrote a book called Adventures of a Novelist where she talks about how she wrote the book, um, and that's very good. She talks about meeting Mary McLean, for example, um, and that's a great story too. Um, she says that uh, some of the rich women in Butte invited Mary McLean to a, to a tea, and formerly they'd, they'd been pretty nasty to her and didn't have the time of day for her, but once she became famous, they all you know, wanted a piece of the action, so they invited her to a tea, and she uh, smoked through the whole tea, which would have been scandalous also, and then she threw her cigarette down on the fancy Aubusson carpet, crushed it out, and then she said, y'all remind me of a lot of hogs at a trough, and then walked out. <laughs> Um, so I, I do like Gertrude Atherton. I don't want to give the uh, illusion that I don't like her, but this book um, is pretty bad. I'll just I'll read you. A, I'll, I'll just read a, a, a short passage, and you can decide for yourself. I am an English teacher, so I pay attention to the prose, I guess. But this clever girl of the people, who might before many years had passed be one of the rich and conspicuous women of the United States above all, the wife of one of the nation's big men, working himself beyond human capacity, harassed, needing not only physical comfort at home, but counsel, companionship, perfect understanding. Might it not be her destiny to equip Ida Compton for her double part? I mean, that's just hard to understand reading it out loud. I mean, the whole, the whole book is, is like that. Um, but I will say that it's dedicated to um, this is a picture of her. Uh, the book is dedicated to Frank J. Edwards and Wilton G. Brown of Helena, Montana, which I think is interesting. This next guy, Willis George Emerson, he was also an interesting discovery. He wrote two novels about Butte. The first is Gray Rocks, 1894, which is also pretty early, and The Builders, 1906. Um, the second novel is baldly plagiarized from the first. Whole pages of dialogue are identical. <laughs> but it sort of makes sense because this guy was all about fraud. He was a notorious con man who perpetrated land swindles throughout the West. In fact, his novels were soundly panned in the Butte and Anaconda papers because the editors recognized him as a swindler who a few years earlier had cheated many locals out of their hard-earned money by selling them worthless land in Idaho that he claimed held promising ore bodies. The best part is that in his novels, he seems to be proud of being a scalawag and sort of brags about this practice, calling some of the regions portrayed in his novels by names such as Gold Bluff and Thief River Valley. <laughs> I don't mean to make any untoward implications myself, but I will add that the biogra biographical sketches of Emerson all emphasize the fact that he was a well-known leader of the Republican Party and a gifted orator. Here's an example of one of his real estate ads. This is from the Anaconda Standard. Um, for forty, buy it now for forty dollars, and you sell it in a year for a hundred. By way of uh, intermission here, this has nothing to do with my book, but I put it in the book. Um, this is a picture of my grandfather. You can see Dad up there. This was my mom's photograph. So that was my father. He's, he worked 40 years in the mines in Butte. Um, and that's outside the Anselmo mine. I'm guessing 40s, maybe 50s. He looks pretty old then. Um, he died in 1966 at uh, 88. And I think he worked in the mines into his 70s. So he was a, a tough old uh, Norwegian. I don't know that. You know, I never knew him. He died before I was born, so I didn't get to know him. Alf Pedersen. So anyway, I, I, I guess I do have credentials. That's why I put it in here. <laughs> um, Charles Cleveland Cohan was uh, author of a 1919 book called Born of the Crucible. Uh, it's an okay novel. It's not great. It's not bad. 
but he's also the author of the Montana State Song, um, which I found interesting. And his book got all kind of rave reviews, mainly because he was uh, involved in newspapers and was friends with all the editors. And they went on at great length saying this should be turned into a five reeler, by which they meant a motion picture. George Wesley Davis. In my research, I also discovered that only one previous attempt had been made to survey the fiction of Butte, and that was a brief 1975 essay by MSU historian Richard Rader, and that name of that essay is called The Copper Pen. But Rader was mostly disparaging of the works to come out of Butte, remarking that, quote, Butte has not been the source of a great American book. I disagreed with virtually every assessment he made in his essay. I, he loved Gertrude Atherton, as I noted earlier, and hated, vehemently hated uh, Donald McCaig's book, The Butte Polka, which I consider one of the best novels to come out of Butte. And I, it, so much so that I wondered if there might have been some personal animosity between the two. Uh, he pretty cruelly panned uh, McCaig's book. However, it turns out that Rader and I do agree wholeheartedly on one point. Sulfur Fumes is the very worst of the novels of Butte. <laughs> in fact, nearly every one of the 40 or so novels I looked at in my book, uh, I found something to like or to love in all of them, except this one. <laughs> but I, actually, that's not true. I love the cover. <laughs> Even though it probably has nothing to do with Butte, this looks like uh, a wagon train on the way to Oregon or California and you know the twin stacks in the background I you know that doesn't look like anything I resemble in, that I remember in Butte but overall it's still a nice cover um, he did write several other books and one of his books actually is not too bad sketches of Butte it's nonfiction and it's essays about some of the characters in Butte um, and I, I did enjoy that but the really interesting thing about Davis has nothing to do with him. Um, he, was, he happened to be the nephew of the richest man in Butte, and I think actually one of the richest people in the country at the time, A.J. Davis, a uh, famous banker in Butte. Um, and when his uncle died, his uncle happened to die uh, never having had children of his own, so he left the entire estate to his nephew who he worked in the bank with, different nephew, not uh, George Wesley. Um, but he had a lot of brothers uh, who had a lot of kids back east. And when they found out that this rich relative died, they, they came out in droves to Butte to lay claim to the estate. As a result, the probate case became very involved and complicated, and the rightful heirs hired the inimitable orator and attorney Robert Ingersoll to protect the estate. Uh, Ingersoll was among the most charismatic characters of the 19th century, and he's well worth investigating if you've never read him. He was Ciceronian in his oratorical talent and delivered some of the most famous lectures of his day, veritable showcases of a skill that has all but vanished from the American horizon. And the trial of uh, the A.J. Davis probate case was so sensational in the 1890s, uh, the media called it the trial of the century, um, although it probably resembled the O.J. Simpson case more than the Scopes monkey trial. Um, but the best part about it was this guy Ingersoll, who, who was uh, just this amazing orator, uh, came to Butte, and while he was working on the case, he found time to deliver several memorable lectures in Butte also, um, long passages of which are preserved in the newspapers. Um, and to connect this back to George Wesley, uh, some of uh, sulfur fumes seems based on events uh, drawn from real life. Now this is one of my favorite of the Butte books. Um, I think I might own the only copy with the actual dust jacket, which is a pretty cool jacket. But it makes it look like a Western. That's, that's one thing I notice about a lot of these Butte books. I, I think uh, it doesn't matter what area you're in, people try to sell books by the cover, and so the cover often doesn't have anything to do with what's actually in the book. Um, the Sheriff of Silver Bowl. Now, now Burton Braley, in his day, was one of the best known and most loved poets in America. Um, he wrote several poems about Butte, which to this day are some of her most quoted encomia. But he also wrote two novels about Butte, um, this one and another one called Shoestring. Uh, 
Annie wrote a, a memoir with long sections in it about Butte called Pegasus Pulls a Hack. Uh, he, worked, he lived and worked in Butte for several years. He worked for the Daily Intermountain and the Butte Evening News. Um, and this book has a lot to, uh, to uh, has a lot going for it, uh, but he was a poet and so he turned some pretty good phrases. But one of my favorite parts of the book is when the sheriff, the titular sheriff of Silverbow, is questioned about the prevalence of violence in Butte compared to more peaceful cities in the West. The sheriff says, and this is a quote, he says, well, nobody thinks of killing anybody in Billings because the town is dead already. <laughs> No offense to anybody from Billings. <laughs> um, and as I noted, Braley was primarily a poet. He wrote many uh, poems about Butte. Uh, and these are collected in Songs of the Workaday World and in a book that I also own that I happen to think bears one of the best titles ever conceived by a mortal person. The title of his other poetry book is A Banjo at Armageddon. Um, Braley spent a few years as a writer and editor at both the leading Butte papers and was known to write the police blotter in verse. <laughs> uh, I will read a short, this is actually a short section of a, of a much longer poem, but I think it'll give you some idea what, a, what, a, what love Burton Braley had for Butte. Um, he, and he really did love Butte. In fact, when somebody asked him, how can you live in that smog-ridden, totally polluted, miserable place? And it's really true, you know, the sulfur fumes used to just cloud the, the town. He just said, oh, well, we, we love it. It, it uh, keeps us from getting the flu. <laughs> so here's his poem. He says, you, she's ugly, you say, old Butte is, and grimy, black, and drear. Why, partner, I could never see it, and I've lived here many a year. There's nothing pretty about her, but somehow she's strong and free. And big and rugged and well, comrade, she looks pretty good to me. Um, I like the comrade in there, too. That's a picture of him and his wife. That was the only uh, picture I could find of him. Dashiell Hammett, author of Red Harvest. Most, most people know Dashiell Hammett as the inventor of the hard-boiled detective novel. His Maltese Falcon is one of the classics of the genre. And Raymond Chandler once said of Hammett that, quote, he pulled murder out of the drawing room and put it into the alley. His Butte novel, Red Harvest, was first published in four installments in a pulp mystery magazine uh, in the, uh, yeah, I guess it would have been 1928, 1929. And it's probably the most famous of all the Butte novels. I'll confess it's also one of my favorites. It's surprisingly brutal. Over two dozen murders take place in it, and a lot of accompanying general mayhem. But the language of the book and its depiction of Butte in the novel, it's called Poisonville, redeem it from the gratuitous violence, sort of. Uh, but what's interesting about the book from a historical perspective and a biographical perspective is just how Hammett came to write the book in the first place. He began his career as a Pinkerton detective, and he worked in several U.S. cities as a professional strike breaker, an occupation that involved equal parts danger and viciousness. And in fact, his biographer, Robert Polito, reports that Lillian Hellman claimed that Hammett once confessed to her that he'd been offered $5,000 to assassinate Frank Little during the strike in 1914. Now, it so happens that Frank Little really was executed by thugs hired in the employ of the company in Butte in 1914, and Hammett was there, but it seems unlikely that he was actually personally involved in the murder. Uh, nevertheless, after his experience in Butte, Hammett abruptly quit the Pinkertons <clears throat> and the business of breaking strikes, and he joined the Communist Party. Uh, and he remained a card-carrying member of the Communist Party uh, for the rest of his life and was called before the House Un-American Activities Committee, like a lot of people in those days, and refused to name names or renounce his party affiliation. And as a result, he's one of the few who actually went to prison. All of this in spite of the fact that Dashiell Hammett served admirably in both World War I and World War II. So he really was a patriot. Um, Frank Little, 
is one of the hallowed saints of organized labor having been assassinated, as I said, by the Anaconda Company during the bitter strike of 1914, hanged by the neck from a railroad trestle in Butte with the 7777 sign of the vigilante mobs uh, pinned to his vest. Actually, there's conflicting accounts. One account says his pants, the other says his vest. Uh, but he figures prominently in many Butte novels, as you can imagine. Uh, and I'll just mention one, uh, Norman MacLeod's The Bitterroots, 1941. And Frank Little was buried in Butte. I love this photograph for many reasons, but especially because I got it from the industrial workers of the world. I, I wrote them a letter and asked if they had a picture of, actually what happened was uh, I tracked down a picture and it belongs to, I think, Purdue University. And they wanted to charge me $70 for it. But I noticed that it said courtesy of the IWW. So I wrote to the IWW and I said, hey, here's this picture of Frank Little. I'd love to use it in this book. This, this college wants me to pay 70, 70 bucks for it. And they said, oh, we'll take care of it. We, we own the rights to all that stuff. And sure enough, five minutes later, I get a letter from Purdue with the, with the picture in my, in my email. Um, but the best part about the picture is it's stamped on the actual photograph, uh, Frank, from the IWW, Missoula, Montana. Um, and no survey of Butte novels would be uh, complete without a serious look at Myron Brinnig. Um, Myron Brinnig was a Butte native. He was, uh, he was raised there. He left when he was 15. Very prolific novelist in his day. I think he wrote about 30 novels. Seven of them are set in Butte or have something to do with Butte. Um, but I want to talk about three of them. Wide Open Town is probably the most famous uh, associated with Butte. And it, many people think it's really the Butte uh, story. Uh, but he wrote two others, Singermon and Sons of Singermon, in 1929 and 1932. And uh, Wide Open Town was right in the middle of those two, 1931. Um, and I recommend all three of these for sure. But the, the Singermon novels, all of them are out of print. Uh, they've been put back into print periodically, but they're really hard to track down. Uh, Singermon and Sons of Singermon is in, are both interesting Butte novels because they're based on his own life, and so they chronicle the life of a family, a Jewish family in Butte, which really brings out the fact that Butte was a cosmopolitan and a metropolitan uh, town in its day. And the other really remarkable thing about these two novels is that the character, the main character in them, is openly gay, uh, which was, you know, that had to be... Uh, somewhat scandalous for 1929 and 1932. Uh, Brinnig himself was gay, although he didn't come out of the closet, at least not until he was in his 80s or early 90s, at least according to uh, Professor Earl Gans, um, who I talked to about most of this stuff. The, uh, Brinnig stopped writing in 1958. He'd written a whole bunch of novels, and they started to not sell as well, and so he just gave it up. He'd made enough money. He bought some land in New Mexico and just settled in there and sort of retired until I think he was in his 70s and then he moved back to New York City. But he just didn't write anything after 1958. And so Professor Gans at U of M assumed that he was dead. And then somebody said, oh no, he's, he's still around. And so he tracked him down, found him in New York City and did a bunch of interviews with him, uh, published them in the uh, Speculator magazine in Butte, and then got uh, Wide Open Town reprinted by Sweetgrass Books. Um, but he never wrote anything else after that, although he did share a few stories and he, he had written a, a memoir uh, that is still unpublished. This guy, James Francis Rabbit. Uh, so Josephine White Bates in the first novel of, of Butte was a pretty exciting discovery, but finding this novel, exceedingly scarce novel, I think there's probably only a few dozen copies of it in existence, uh, but finding this book was also pretty exciting. Uh, I really love the book. It's another hard-boiled detective novel. Uh, this guy was also a Butte native. It was the only book he published, and it sold poorly. I could find out very little about the guy, even though I tracked down a few of his uh, remaining relatives in Houston, Texas. They just didn't know that much about him. He died young. Uh, I think he was only uh, 60 when he died. Uh, it owes debts clearly to Hammett and Brinnig, uh, but Rabbit wrote in a voice and idiom entirely his own. 
For example, uh, he described a police captain in the book this way. He looked the way Abraham Lincoln would have looked if he'd been Irish. <laughs> I, I don't know what that is, but I, I love it. Um, and the other really interesting thing about this book is that, that it features a female character who for 1935 must have been pretty, pretty shocking. And I'll, I'll read a small section of it. But before I do, um, I'd point out that he was raised, his father died in the mines when he was three. So his mother raised the four children entirely on her own um, while campaigning for women's suffrage. So she was probably a hell of a role model. Um, I'll just read this small section um, that talks about, I actually quote some of the novel here to give you an idea. Uh, but one of the more admirable features of this book echoes one of the striking themes from A Blind Lead and the works of Mary MacLean, a three-dimensional female protagonist who refuses to be constrained by the proprietary notions of the men around her. Therese Dubois, as the widow of the murdered Broderick, makes a definitive femme fatale, but she is even more memorable for being unapologetic about her intelligence and sexuality. In response, McFarlane, the main character in the book, breaks away from the mold of hard-boiled gumshoe since he uncharacteristically admires rather than condemns her for these qualities. At one point he says, you're not ashamed of being intelligent, are you? <laughs> and then he encourages her to pursue her theatrical aspirations on her, own, on her own terms and to avoid male management. He also refuses to castigate her for her sexual appetite and, in fact, lauds her self-confidence when she delivers what must have been a pretty uh, shocking declaration in 1935. And here's, this is a quote from the book. Here's what she says. I know what they say about me in town, but I don't care. They're content to stay with one man, to cook greasy meals over hot fires, to lose their looks and figures having a lot of kids. I don't want that. I won't have that. So they call me fast because I will not be a fool, because I don't have to be a fool. Um, and I say that, you know, that could have been drawn from an Erica Jong novel in 1970. <laughs> um, so he's, he's a, a, a pretty accomplished writer. I mean, it's, it's a fun book to read if you can find it. And it's also a convincing mystery with a surprising and plausible climax. Another great Butte treasure is, uh, I don't know why that's blank right there. He, he does have his clothes on. Um, anyway, this, this guy, uh, I guess I'll just tell the story this way. Um, when, I, when I first moved back to Montana, <coughs> excuse me, after graduate school in Georgia, I wound up on the board of KGPR um, Public Radio in Great Falls. And at the time, the guy running the, the board was a lawyer named Joe Duffy. And when he learned that I'd been born in Butte, we hit it off pretty well. Uh, and knowing that I taught literature, he was always asking me if I'd ever read his grandfather's book. So years later, when the idea of a survey of Butte literature started to distill in my mind, I remembered the title and I tracked it down. And although Joe, the Joe that I knew, died a few years ago, I ended up connecting with his uh, little brother, Michael, in Butte, and he's the guy who gave me this great picture. This was a Christmas card, and you can see him reading his own book. Um, and he gave me some great stories about this guy. Uh, Joe Duffy, the elder, so this was their grandfather. Um, he was a famous Butte character himself. He was a laundryman and, a, and, a, and a, just a general prankster. He perpetrated the Centerville ghost hoax for years. Um, and he also wrote a column for the Butte Evening News, uh, generally pretty funny. And he served several terms in the legislature. Um, but he wrote this great book, Butte Was Like That. And I think it's one of the most important of the Butte novels. It's, it's not a great narrative. Um, but James Joyce once claimed that if uh, Dublin had been destroyed during World War II, they could have rebuilt the entire city just from his descriptions in Ulysses. Um, and I think that's certainly true of Butte uh, with this book. He describes everything in astounding detail. Um, everything that you could ever want to know about Butte lore is in this book. It, it does have a central character and the loosest of plots, but it's mainly a, a platform for him to talk about all of the different cultural aspects of Butte that people are so interested in. The mines, the miners, the way people talk, 
the personalities of every neighborhood, Thin Town, the Cabbage Patch, Meterville, Centerville, Walkerville, Dublin Gulch, they're all here. The exotic food, the neighborhood bars, the infamous characters like Fat Jack Kelly, Shoestring Annie, Madame Mae Malloy, all in exhaustive detail and very colorful prose. The guy, he was quite a writer. Uh, this book is exceedingly rare now and a fine copy featuring the uh, expertly embossed cover made by Butte artist Charles Pearson. Probably cost you a couple hundred dollars. Um, but the guy who designed, it's hard to tell from the picture, but the, it's a 3D cover. Like, uh, it's actually embossed, kind of like a, an old, uh, what do they call them, yearbooks? Annual, thank you. Butte in the Pulps, I had to put a chapter in uh, here. The funny thing is, this is actually a great book. It's a great novel. And all of the pulps that I talked about are actually very competent novels written by really competent writers who were sort of working class writers. They were making money, you know, trying to make a living. They weren't uh, trying to do art. Although, in spite of themselves, they produced what I think are pretty fair uh, narratives about Butte. Um, this one I love, just the cover is great. So Coppertown is a swift-paced, well-written tale of uh, the era of the Copper Kings. Um, as a pulp novel, it takes chances more literary efforts might not, including, and this killed me when I read it, the unlikely event of a sex scene at the 2,000-foot level of a mine in Butte. I'll just, I'll just read this. <laughs> I, not the act. I'm not going to read the sex scene. I'll, just, I'll read you what I wrote about it. Um, let's see. So to its credit, Coppertown tells a story with economy and verve, which are no doubt the expected virtues of a book that might w very well have been categorized as pornography at, in 1951. And yet, after a racy scene in which the female lead, Kit Douglas, enjoys an uncharacteristically vivid sex scene with Drake Hughes, who is meant to depict Augustus Heinze, she descends much like Molly Bloom, again in Ulysses, into a stream of consciousness reverie. I mean, really, it's like you're reading this, Har it's a Harlequin romance. And then all of a sudden you're reading a passage that could have been in Ulysses, a stream of consciousness. Not the usual stuff of a softcore 50s Western pulp novel. Uh, in any case, this novel must be among the first, if not the only, to present the two leading characters effecting sexual congress at the 2,000-foot level of a mine deep beneath the richest hill on earth. <laughs> and the other one, I'm not going to talk too much about this other one, Halfway to Hell, it's called. I'll just read you the back of the cover. And, the, you know, you can't judge a book really by the cover. I know that's true. But um, if you bought this book based on what it says on the back, you'd probably be disappointed because it has nothing to do with what's in the book. <laughs> So this is actually a pretty good book, too, but here's what it says. Butte, Montana. It was built overnight out of blood and sweat and dreams, a yowling, brawling, boozing hellhole where a man could wake up poor and die rich between sunrise and sunset. Like a whirlpool of violence, it pulled drifters from the four winds, gamblers, gun dogs with iron muscles and a hunger gnawing at their guts and a belly full of lead for anyone who got in their way. Makes it sound like a Western. <laughs> It was the kind of town that had to be tamed, not by a gun, but by a man. A man too big for the devil himself to break. <laughs> um, and that book, you know, rivals Cormac McCarthy. In fact, I thought of Cormac McCarthy a lot when I was reading this because it's so graphic. There's a scene where uh, a timber or something falls on a guy in the mine and they send a runner to the hardware store to get a number four bit to put in a brace so they can drill through the guy's skull to relieve the pressure. Like, this is described in vivid detail. Um, in, the other interesting thing about this guy, Paul Fairman, is he actually wrote uh, many sitcoms for television. He worked on The Partridge Family uh, later. So he wrote in lots of science fiction novels. He was mainly a science fiction guy. Um, this guy wrote uh, one novel. As far as I know, it's the only thing he wrote, Do Not Go Gentle in 1960. He was also from Butte. Butte native, uh, and this is one of the best war novels uh, of World War II probably you'll ever read. Um, but it starts out in Butte. He was from Walkerville, and the book tracks the, it's a coming of age, the first part of it, 
kid grows up in Walkerville with an alcoholic father who's a minor. Father dies, uh, and he ends up going into the Marines. And then the bulk of the novel is about Guadalcanal. Um, and then the aftermath of his life, uh, trying to recover from that in Los Angeles. Great, great book, very well written. Uh, it was a bestseller when it came out, and then the guy fell off the map. He, he, he was a professor of English at Riverside in California, um, but didn't ever write another book. One other interesting thing about it is that the main character is named Norman MacLeod, who I told you earlier wrote a Butte novel called The Bitterroots. And the name is spelled slightly differently, but um, I'm almost certain that he must have studied writing with this guy Norman MacLeod, who was kind of famous as a vagabond, drunken poet who traveled around the country teaching creative writing uh, wherever he could get a job. Uh, and he did spend several years in Missoula and in Butte, so um, it's a theory, but I have no evidence for it yet. Oh. Richard K. O'Malley, author of Mile High, Mile Deep, um, wrote what I think critics universally agree is one of the very best novels of Butte. Uh, one critic said that if you're only going to read one novel of Butte, make sure it's this one. And I sort of have to agree. While there are other Butte novels I like more for personal reasons, I do think that Mile High, Mile Deep provides a better and more comprehensive glimpse of what Butte means than any other single book. And one other great feature of this book is that it doesn't dwell tediously on the Copper Kings. In fact, it takes place during the 1920s and 30s and provides, therefore, a view of Butte that is much closer to what we see even today, the brutal reality of poverty, limited opportunity, and for miners and their families, the ever-present specter of death and tragedy. O'Malley was a journalist, and he came to this novel rather late in life, and at the encouragement of his colleagues who thought his stories of Butte, uh, you know, he was such a great storyteller, apparently they said, uh, you should really put this down in writing. So he did. Uh, and the result was Mile High, Mile Deep, which really is uh, a great introduction to the literature of Butte. Um, and I could probably stretch my presentation out for several days. Um, but if I'm honest, I must acknowledge that the average person is probably not as obsessed with this material as I am. And so I've left out tonight many novels that I truly enjoyed. Um, if you get a copy of my book, Literary Butte, you'll get the full treatment, including a chapter on uh, films about Butte as well. But I wanted to end with what was among my most cherished experiences in reading the novels of Butte, The Thin Air Gang by Butte poet Ed Leahy. Ed Leahy was uh, also a, a Butte guy, a, a guy who worked in the mines and knew all of Butte's travails firsthand. Uh, and this novel moved me because it's also set in the 20s and 30s, actually mostly the 30s. And it's not about mining so much as about doing whatever you could to escape the mines, uh, which for Ed Leahy's father in the 1930s was to run moonshine. So it's really a, a novel about moonshiners. It captures the desperation of the, des of the depression in a way that rivals the grapes of wrath, and he does it with a poet's finesse. I personally connected with this story because my parents and grandparents lived in Butte during those years as well. And so I grew up listening to uh, a lot of similar stories about what uh, Leahy talks about. I'll just read you a small section of that, too. Um, Leahy uh, convinces the reader with slight and subtle sentences that moonshining in Butte during the Depression was just one rendition of a desperate drama in which everyone in the country not born into wealth and privilege was forced to play a part. Anxiously eluding the police becomes a powerful metaphor for scraping by on a subsistence wage in constant fear of injury or getting fired. Leahy deftly evokes the sense of stress that poverty creates, and he shows how those at the bottom are enmeshed in a system of relentless overlapping injustices. And in doing so, he collapses nearly a century of life in Butte into a few months in the 1930s, capturing the mood and tenor of Butte in ways that few 21st century novelists are able. Um, I would say Richard K. O'Malley's book is also one of those, and uh, I don't talk about it tonight, but Richard Wheeler's um, book, The Richest Hill on Earth, I would also include in that, that category. Um, 
this last photo is also in the book, and I just said amateur miners in Butte around 1948. Um, that's all I said about it. But that, that little guy there with the, uh, the helmet on, that's my father, about three years old. And my uncle, Bud, his older brother, um, and I doubt they're actually digging a shaft for gold. They're probably just drilling a well for water. But this is out at the Four Mile in Butte, probably 1948. Um, and he sure looks like a little miner there. And there's a lot of things I love about this picture, but it does evoke some sense of, um, I think a lot of people in Butte ended up in the mines because it's what their fathers did. And, um, you know, my father was probably, well, he was the first person in his family to get a college education, so um, he easily could have ended up wearing that hat for real. And there's the book. I'm happy to answer any questions. If People have them.